Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to our Tales from the Deep. It's a very special one today. And we are here with OceanWise, which is a global international not for profit organization dedicated to protecting the marine world. And our vision is an ocean that is healthy and flourishing. But we are here in Vancouver today. And that means we are on the traditional, ancestral, and unceded territory of the Musqueam, Squamish, and Tsleil-Waututh First Nations. So we are very honored to be able to be on their land today and to be able to talk to others and share stories and use that traditional knowledge that is so important to science and conservation or protecting the natural world around us including some of the creatures we may learn about today. So I'd love to introduce you to Rachel Nelson, who's going to be our guest today. So Rachel, take it away. Hi everyone, and thank you guys uh, so much for having me. Um, my name is Rachel. I am one of the marine mammal trainers at the Vancouver Aquarium. Um, I've been there for almost four, just over four years now, and I have actually been focused with the sea otters um, for that four years. So I know a lot of uh, sea otter facts, and I'm really excited today. I get to talk to you guys about sea otters um, and basically give you a rundown of just um, a lot of the basic questions we get. A lot of things that um, people wonder about and then I uh, give you an introduction to the otters that we have. We have a lot of otters at the Vancouver Aquarium right now. Um, so giving you um, some of their background, why they're here with us and then um, into what kind of training we do with them, um, what their kind of day-to-day -day training looks like and uh, what we're planning to do in the future. So I have a presentation ready for you guys. Uh, so basically what I'm going to be talking to you guys about today is everything sea otters. Sea otters, um, their rescue, their rehabilitation, uh, where they are, why they're there, and why we have the otters that we have at the Vancouver Aquarium. Um, so we'll touch a little bit just on their natural history, just kind of those basic background things um, for the start of the presentation. And then we'll move into um, the, the personalities and the, all the fun things about the otters that we have and um, how we build up our relationships with them. Uh, so being at the Vancouver Aquarium, um, especially when we were doing our programming and our sea otter encounters, um, there are a lot of questions that people have and a lot of them, they are repeats. So it does seem to have um, quite a few questions that a lot of people want to know. Um, so number one question always is, what are they eating? Um, and then people also want to know how long do they live for? Um, how long do they hold their breath for? A lot of kids like to point and be like, why is that otter doing Doing that. Um, and a lot of um, our diehard um, Vancouver Aquarium visitors really want to know how do we tell our sea otters apart, um, which can be really hard. If you ever look at our sea otters and they're all uh, lucky that I get to stare at their faces single day. So I kind of get to um, figure out the ways to tell them apart. So I'll be able to give you guys some tips and uh, tricks to how to tell them apart if you watch any of our live cameras. Uh, so basically, what is a sea otter? One of the um, more interesting things that people find out is the difference between river otters and sea otters. There's a lot of people who, um, especially in BC, will come up and say, I saw something that kind of looked like an otter, um, but I'm not really sure. How do you tell the difference? Uh, so in Vancouver, especially if you're kind of around Stanley Park area, we actually don't have sea otters um, that are naturally in the water. So a lot of what people see are river otters. Um, and the biggest, easiest way to tell them apart is actually by taking a look at their hinds. Um, river otters, they have paws on those back feet, whereas sea otters, they do actually have flippers. So they are meant to be in the water. They are so agile. They're so great at swimming. They do actually have flippers instead of paws. So that is a kind of quick and easy way if you take a look at them and you are wondering what it is. If it has paws, it's a river otter. If it has flippers, it's a sea otter. 
Um, another way is also by size. As sea otters, they are generally quite a bit larger. Um, our biggest male right now is about 30 kilograms, but they can actually get up to about 40. Uh, whereas river otters, they're generally quite a bit smaller. They look more like a weasel or a ferret, so very long and skinny. Um, whereas the sea otters, they're a bit um, bulkier, they look fuzzier, um, and they're also just quite a bit larger. Um, and then also, if you're lucky enough to uh, see them swimming and interacting, um, if you see an animal that is floating on their back with their bellies up, that is a sea otter. So that is a sea otter behavior. Um, they spend the majority of their time swimming on their backs with that belly up, which they use like a plate. Um, but river otters, they actually will swim with their bellies down, kind of do the little doggy paddle that um, a lot of other animals do. Uh, so that's kind of just a, an illustration of the two different kinds. So you can see on the one side that uh, river otter has that really long, uh, narrow body, and they have those paws on that back, those back feet. And then we've got a picture of two of our sea otters, as you can see, floating on their backs, bellies up, um, quite a bit fuzzier, quite a bit larger in size. And sea otters, um, they do have quite a large range. So um, they do inhabit along our coastline. So all the way down in California, all the way up to Alaska, and they do range over to Russia as well. Um, and they are native to those waters. Um, basically, they're, they were hunted to extinction in different areas at one point, but right now they have kind of um, been redis Uh, they were hunted to extinction. So right now there are populations in Russia, there's Alaska, um, in BC along the coast of Vancouver Island, they do have a growing population of sea otters. So if you go over to Tofino, if you go out on boats on that coastline there, you can actually see wild sea otters, which is amazing to see. Um, and down in California, they do have um, quite a number of sea otters. So if you're um, down around Monterey Bay, that's an amazing place to go and see wild wild sea otters if that is something that you want to do. Um, so they do have quite a large different range and sea otters, they are actually split up into two different subspecies. So there's a northern sea otter and a southern sea otter. And the southerns, they are quite actually um, quite a smaller population. They're actually just down in California, Washington area. So they are um, quite limited in their range, whereas the ones that are in Canada, Alaska and Russia are all northern sea otters. Um, there's not a huge difference between the two subspecies. The northerns are generally a bit larger in size. Um, the smallers are a bit smaller and they do have a, a little differences in their skull shape, but they do have those two different subspecies. Um, the Vancouver Aquarium has only northern sea otters. So all um, seven, all seven of our otters are northern sea otters. Um, but if you go down into um, the States, if you go visit a facility down there, um, most likely they will have a southern sea otters. So that's just a little bit more. So the, um, like I said, the two different subspecies and all of ours, they are northern sea otters, as well as the ones that are up in Alaska Sea Life Center. If you're following any of their uh, uh, Instagram or Facebook feeds and you see the little sea otter pups that they have coming through, those are all northern sea otters as well. And sea otters, um, they normally live fairly close to the coastline. So anywhere that has that kelp forest, that's actually an amazing natural habitat for sea otters. These guys, they uh, will swim down to the bottom to pick up food. So places like kelp forests are amazing because um, there is a lot of food for them there. There are things like sea urchins, mussels, um, those kind of animals, those invertebrates do usually um, stick a little closer to the coastline. Um, and these animals, they eat a lot of food, so they really do follow that food source. So if they are in an area in a kelp forest where they have lots of food, but then they end up eating all of it, they will move on to a different area where that food is a little bit more plentiful. Um, the kelp is also really helpful for the mothers and um, they will actually wrap that kelp around their pups. That way their pups won't drift away in the, the tides. And if sea otters are swimming, they can also just wrap that around them if they want to take a little nap. That way they can.
actually come out onto land very often. So most of their life is spent out in the ocean, um, though they do live in that kind of close to uh, land area. So sometimes they will come out on little rocky outcrops and things like that. Um, but if you've ever seen a sea otter on land at the Vancouver Aquarium, you'll see that they're actually not very graceful or fast on land. So as soon as they do come out on land, things like predators can start to become a problem. So um, out in the ocean, wild sea otters, they normally will spend the majority of their life in the water. Another way to protect themselves from predators is they actually form large groups that they called that are called rafts. Um, so they they kind of form a safety in numbers group, and they actually can get quite a large number of animals. Um, I believe it was down in California. There was a huge raft of otters that they could actually see from a satellite. It was hundreds of sea otters. Uh, so they definitely can form very large groups. Normally, it's actually the females that will congregate together. Um, the males are a little bit more adventurous. They are the ones that kind of will uh, go out and search for new territory or new food, especially once the males get to that mating age, they will uh, wander away and start finding their own groups of females. Um, but they do actually form really, really large groups of rafts. Um, and that's actually where you can see that um, paw holding behavior. If you're a fan of that, that is uh, something that large groups of rafts of otters will do as well. Perfect timing, holding paws together. So <laughs> that is a natural uh, sea otter behavior. Like I was mentioning, sea otters um, will use this behavior to stick together, um, especially when they're in those rafts, if they're sleeping, that way they aren't separated by things like winds or tides or waves. Um, so they do actually hold paws. Uh, we had two of our otters at the Vancouver Aquarium, Katmai and Tanu, who were um, quite famous for holding their paws together. Uh, it is a really adorable behavior if you ever catch it. Um, and it was actually more Tanu who seemed to enjoy holding paws with Katmai. If Katmai was sleeping, Tanu would kind of sneak on in there and try to grab onto Katmai's paw. Um, unfortunately, Tanu passed away about a year ago, and so not all of our younger otters have discovered this yet. I have caught Katmai and Kunik holding paws, but it was only once and it was very brief. But I'm uh, holding holding my fingers across that hopefully the, they'll start to catch on doing that because it is a very cute, sweet behavior to see them uh, doing together. Which brings us to sea otter pups. Um, this is, I believe, a fan favorite. People always seem to enjoy uh, sea otter pups. It's hard not Just and wait a moment for Rachel problems. to come back. Rachel, we just lost you for a minute there. Do you okay. just mind going back to the start of this slide? Yeah, so this is uh, about sea otter pups. Uh, so sea otter babies are actually very high maintenance. Um, usually when they're born, they're completely reliant on their mothers. So they don't know how to groom themselves. They don't know how to uh, find food for themselves. And as an extra bonus, they're fluffy baby fur is so fluffy that they actually cannot swim. So they are not physically able to even look for their own food. They will basically just float on the surface like a little fuzzy cork. Um, so for that first six months of their lives, they're completely dependent on their moms. Mom has to teach them how to groom their fur. Um, she provides milk for them. And usually around six months old is when they will start to become weaned onto more solid food and off of that milk. Which brings us to what do uh, sea otters eat? This is something that is quite a fan favorite. Um, if you ever get a chance to see a training session, you'll see that our sea otters get a lot of food. Um, and even though they live in the ocean, it's usually quite surprising for people to learn that they don't eat a whole lot of fish. Um, so at the aquarium, we feed them surf clams, uh, squid, pollock, cape lamb, which is a, a little kind of skinny fish, but really the majority of what they eat is that surf clam. 
Um, every once in a while, we do give them a live crab or a live sea urchin as an extra special treat, which is really fun to watch them uh, try to figure that out. Katmai, since she's almost eight years old, is a pro at eating the crabs and sea urchins. Um, but the younger ones, since they've never really seen that before, um, it is a great enrichment and learning experience for them to try to figure out, oh, well, how do I get to the stuff inside? Um, we actually gave Taslina her first sea urchin a couple weeks ago, and she just looked at it, and then she looked at me, and then she looked at it again, and then she swam over to a different rock, and she put her little sea urchin on the rock, and then just backed up and looked at it. And she's like, what am, what am I supposed to do with this? And then Kat my swam over and she stole it and she ate it. So Tazlina has a little bit more to learn on how to uh, eat sea urchins and crabs, but I'm guessing that she's going to be watching Kat my the next time that we give that to them. Um, but out in the ocean, basically lots of invertebrates is what sea otters will eat. So things like crabs, sea urchins, snails, mussels, abalone. They are very good at cracking open those hard shells to get the uh, tasty food inside. And like I was mentioning before, sea otters, they are quite unique because they have to eat so much food. <laughs> they eat about a quarter of their body weight every single day. Um, so we have usually five training sessions a day and each one of their food buckets can be about a kilogram of food at least. So it is a lot of food. And basically it's because sea otters, um, they have a very high metabolism, but they also have very low body fat. So underneath that fur, they really don't have a whole lot of fat to stay warm. So they're eating continuously to stay warm in that cold water. Um, it's about $85 a day per sea otter to feed them. So um, they are one of the most expensive animals to feed here at the Vancouver Aquarium. And um, we do weigh our otters usually at least twice a week. Um, as you can imagine, their weights can fluctuate at times, especially in the summer or the winter months. When it gets cold, they eat a little bit more. In the summertime, they're more interested in napping than they are in eating. But we do want to make sure those are accurate food amounts that we give them. So we do weigh them quite often. That way we can make sure we can adjust their food as we need to. And another thing about sea otters, uh, a lot of people, because sea otters are so cute, will ask um, what happens if I w find sea otters and I want to go swim with them, or if I'm in a kayak and I see sea otters, can I go up to them? And the thing is with sea otters, because if you think about what they eat, they have to crack open really hard shells to get to that food. Sea otters have evolved very strong jaws. Um, so it's actually said sea otters have roughly the same bite strength as a black bear. So we always like to say that if you do see wild sea otters, yes, they are adorable, but also give them that very respectful distance uh, because they do have that very strong bite. Um, and they do, like I said, bite through those very hard shells to get that food. They also really love ice treats. And if you ever see them given an ice treat, they can actually chomp through that ice with no problem. So it really shows you how strong those jaws are. Um, and unlike a lot of other marine mammals, um, sea otters actually will chew their food. Most other marine mammals will swallow fish whole. So things like dolphins, sea lions, they actually are just swallowing that fish, but sea otters will actually chew up all of that food. And that other question, how long can they hold their breath? Um, it's usually about five minutes is the longest. They can dive down quite deep. Um, and basically this is all evolved. So they will hold their breath. They will swim down to the bottom. They will gather up as much of food as they can carry. And then they come back up to the surface. Um, and the more food that they can carry, the less time, less amount of time they need to use their energy diving. So that is something um, they can hold their breath for a couple of minutes, but they're not like dolphins or whales that can stay underwater for 10, 15, 20 minutes at a time. So it is a little bit shorter than that. Another fun thing about sea otters is that they are animals that know how to use tools. 
Uh, so something that sea otters do is that they will use their belly like a plate and then they will go get a rock and they will actually use that rock to smash open those hard shells. Um, so it is quite amazing to see them do that. It is a very, very interesting and very smart thing that they have figured out how to do. Um, and they will pick up those rocks and they will hammer open those hard shells very quickly. Uh, usually they can get into whatever they're trying to get into very fast. And this is really important. So why, why do we care about sea otters? Why do we want people to connect to sea otters and care about them? And it's because sea otters are a keystone species, which means that they're really important. And we actually learned this the hard way. In the early 1900s, sea otters were hunted to extinction along our coastline, and that was for their fur. And that's because of that super dense fur everybody was trying to get. And we actually ended up hunting all of those sea otters along our coast until there were none left. And although that was already terrible, we obviously don't want to uh, hunt an animal to extinction, it also was really apparent very quickly how important those animals are. So sea otters, they eat sea urchins, and what they actually do is control that sea urchin population. And without those sea otters around to eat those sea urchins, the sea urchin population increased massively which didn't seem like a big problem until those sea urchins started eating all of the kelp forest. And so they actually ended up decimating a lot of the local kelp forest. And those kelp forests are very important. That's where things like fish and invertebrates live. Um, so without those sea otters around, there was this trickle down effect where it hugely impacted our local ecosystem. So that was uh, something that we learned the hard way, but luckily we were able to transplant sea otters back along our coastline. And because of that, um, we've been able to help out our local ecosystem be in balance again. And that was um, in the 1969 to around 1972, they actually um, took some Alaskan sea otters and they relocated them uh, to the west coast of Vancouver Island. So where they normally used to uh, live and they've actually been doing really well. So the population has um, been stable and not only stable, it's actually been increasing, which is amazing to see. Uh, so we have over 5,000 sea otters along that coastline of Vancouver Island now. Um, to the point where, like I said, you can go out on a boat in Tofino and you can see wild sea otters, which is amazing. Uh, so we are really lucky to have them back. And uh, we're lucky that because of those sea otters, we can actually have that healthy ecosystem again. And this is one of my favorite parts of sea otters. So sea otters fur. Um, if you look at a sea otter, it's hard to miss how fuzzy and cute and adorable they are. And they do spend a lot of their day grooming that fur. It is uh, very important because like I mentioned uh, a couple slides ago, they don't have a whole lot of body fat to stay warm. Uh, so they really do depend on that fur to keep them warm. And so because of that, they spend about a third of their day actually grooming their fur. Um, that way they can make sure that all of the, any oils, any bits Bits of fish or clam juice, um, all of that comes out of their fur. If you see them um, grooming and then napping on a hot sunny day, that is prime sea otter fuzzy time. So that is uh, the best time to try to catch a fuzzy sea otter. And they do have the densest fur coat in the animal kingdom. So this is actually why they were hunted to extinction is because they have a million hairs per square inch and that actually makes their fur waterproof. So their fur is so densely packed that the water actually cannot reach their skin, uh, which is pretty amazing. When you think about it, you see sea otters swimming in the ocean. You see them playing in the ocean, um, really not spending a lot of time outside of the ocean, but under Underneath that fur, their skin, if it's a healthy otter, will be completely dry the entire time. Um, so that is a really important fact for sea otters. If they don't groom their fur properly, they can actually um, get a lot of uh, problems like hypothermia because the fur, if it parts, the water will get down to that skin. And like I said, they don't have a lot of body fat to stay warm so they can get cold very quickly. 
Um, another cool thing about sea otters is they can actually blow warm air into their fur. Um, so they'll actually just nuzzle their noses right up in there and they blow that warm air. And then because their fur is so thick, it actually becomes trapped in there and it forms another insulating layer for them. And if a sea otter does lose that insulating capacity, um, like I said, hypothermia, pneumonia, those are all things that are very real things that can happen to them. Um, that's actually why things like oil spills are so dangerous for sea otters is because they are covered in that oil. They can't clean it out of their fur properly. And then that leads to them getting very cold very quickly. And because that fur is so important for them, they do have a couple of pretty cool adaptations. Um, one is that their fur is very loose, so it's only attached in a couple of places. So their little paws, little flippers, little noses, um, but everything else is actually very loose, like a big sweater. So sea otters can actually grab their fur from their back, move it to their front, and then that way they can make sure it's properly clean. Um, sea otters are also very flexible, so you can actually see them kind of roll up into a tiny ball. That way they can properly uh, clean their tail and their flippers and all those things. And the favorite, especially from all the children, is do sea otters have pockets? And yes, they do. So what it is, like I said, they're very loose fur and it forms a natural fold underneath each armpit. So they do have little pockets underneath each armpit um, and they can use those pockets to store food. Um, they can store rocks. If they find a rock out in the ocean, that's like really good at cracking open hard shells. They can actually hold that into their little pocket. That way they can keep using it. Um, at the aquarium, we don't give our sea otters rocks because that's just a recipe for disaster. Um, but we do give them lots of toys. We give them lots of ice. We give them lots of food. Um, this is a picture of Katmai presenting her pocket to us. And she can usually fit about six ice treats down one of her pockets and then pretend that she does not have anything. Uh, so she she's very good at using her pockets. Uh, so that was a bit of a background, just our general uh, sea otter questions and answers, things that we get asked a lot. Um, but this is, I'm sure, what people are excited about is meeting the otters that we have at the Vancouver Aquarium. Um, I, forgive me if I say we only have six sea otters because until recently we did only have six, but we've recently had a seventh join us. Uh, so we do have seven sea otters in total now at the Vancouver Aquarium. Uh, so our oldest is Katmai. So these are some Katmai baby pictures of her up in Alaska. Um, her crazy eyes always make me laugh. She had very, very buggy little eyes. But as you can see, she was very small. Um, she was found up in Alaska all by herself. Um, and she was brought to the Alaska Sea Life Center uh, to um, go through her rehabilitation. So we actually were really lucky. We were able to send trainers um, from the aquarium up to Alaska to help her uh, rehabilitation. Um, so there was over 83 days put into rehabilitating Katmai. And Katmai was actually named after um, at the park, um, Katmai National Park, which is close to the area that she was found. And then she came to the aquarium in March 2013, um, as you can see in the picture there. So that is actually Christy, uh, one of our former marine mammal trainers up there with Katmai. Um, so we have had a long, long time with her. She's been with us for about eight years now almost. Um, but she doesn't look small anymore, so this is her now. Um, she's usually quite distinctive. Um, she does have the blondest fur out of all of her otters. Um, she never really lost her crazy eyes. She's got very big eyes, and she's also a very active otter, so she's very intelligent. Um, she's very adventurous, very curious. She's usually the one who is getting into all the things that she's not supposed to. Um, she's very very active with all of her enrichments. Um, and she's also um, been going through something recently where we've had a lot of new baby otters come through. So she, in the last couple of years, has um, been meeting all of our younger otter pups and she's uh, done really well at that. So that's something that um, she actually embraced. She's a very good um, fun aunt, I would say. <laughs> 
And then um, we have a lot of otters that are under the age of four right now. So we have a lot of very uh, what, young or what we call juvenile otters. Um, so this is Mac. Mac is, I would say, my secret favorite. He is a uh, just the most gentle, lovely, squishy, big male otter. Um, he was born in 2016. Um, he was also found up in Alaska. So a lot of our sea otters were um, found up in Alaska. And he was admitted to the Alaska Sea Life Center. They thought him to be roughly about a week old. Um, and the cool thing about Mac is that he was found at a time very close uh, to one of our other sea otters, so Kunik. Um, so the two of them actually went through uh, their rehabilitation together, which I have an adorable photo of in a couple of slides. Um, but this is Mac's baby photo. As you can see, he still has that crazy upturned whisker on the one side, which he never grew out of. Um, Mac is very distinctive because he actually sucks on his paw while he's sleeping, um, which is um, very cute. So if you ever see a sea otter who's um, sucking on his paw while he's having a nap, that is Mac. Um, he never lost that upturned whisker, so he does have like almost like a crazy mustache look to him. Uh, he's very interactive with his toys. He really loves the tubs. He really loves little boomer balls. Um, he likes to have all of his toys in the water. So if they're out of the water, he will gather them all up and bring them back into the water to play with them. Um, and he also does, like I mentioned, have a very special bond with Kunik. And that's most likely because of the uh, amount of time they've spent together from a very young age. And this is them together um, as pups. So they were found very similar in time. Um, so they actually spent a lot of time together, as you can see, as babies, um, which is ridiculously cute. Which brings me to Kunik. Uh, so she was also found in 2016. She was brought to the Alaska Sea Life Center. Um, she was actually washed ashore all by herself on Homer Spit in Alaska. And Mac and Kunik took an airplane ride um, in November all the way from Alaska down to Vancouver. Um, and the two of them came here and have been here ever since. Um, and Kunik actually means kiss, which is uh, adorable because she's very, very cute and dainty. Um, as a pup, she had the craziest eyes I have ever seen. She had the, the pug thing going on where her eyes actually almost looked in different directions. Um, but as she grew up, she's grown into her face a little bit. So she, uh, she's now a very dainty little otter. She has always been very small. Um, she has a kind of dark pointed little nose. Um, she has the darkest fur out of all of them. She's got very small little flippers, very small little paws. Um, she is also very smart. So she is a little mini cat my. She actually taught herself how to untie knots, which is crazy to me. And if you watch her do it, she uses her paws. She uses her, she uses her teeth, she uses her flippers. Um, she's just crazy smart. And um, she is also um, very dominant in our otter group. Also, the boys really enjoy to um, basically cater to her every women desire. So she, when we give our otters ice treats, um, Kunik will actually steal all the ice treats from all of the boys. And then she will lay just like this and have all of her ice treats on her belly. And all the boys will just look at her and be like, okay, this is fine. And then after that, we got another otter. <laughs> this is Rialto. Um, Rialto, he's actually a little bit different. He wasn't found in Alaska like most of our previous otters. Um, he was actually found down in Washington. Um, so he was found on Rialto Beach um, in 2016 as well in August. Um, he was found all by himself by a wilderness ranger. And he did have a couple um, different things going on with him. He had um, some pneumonia. He had some GI issues. Um, he actually was given a very low uh, chance of survival, but he is a strong little fighter. So he actually made it through all of the different um, things he was going through. 
and he actually went to the Seattle Aquarium for his rehabilitation. Um, we were sending trainers down to Washington to help with that. Um, and that's actually a big reason why Rialto has such a massive following down in Seattle. People will actually come up from Seattle and come to the aquarium and want to know which one is Rialto. Uh, so he has quite a fan club uh, who are all rooting for him. Um, and he came to the aquarium in September 2016th when he was um, a little bit stronger. He uh, he didn't get to take a plane. He took a car, um, but he's still uh, pretty adorable. And like I said, people uh, really love to hear Rialto's story and follow how he's doing. Um, he was a very rambunctious pup. <laughs> I would say out of all of the pups that we had come through in the last couple of years, Rialto had the most opinions. Um, and we still had him on bottle feeds when he came up to the aquarium. So um, we were still doing the 24 hour care with him. Uh, so you can see here he's getting his uh, bottle feed. And now he is a big male. He is, I believe about 30 kilograms was his last weight. Um, he's just a very, big stocky male he's got very light cheeks and his whiskers kind of look like a little mustache which is usually how i tell him apart from the other ones um, he's got a big nose um, he does love the love toys but he's actually the most interactive at those underwater windows um, so if you ever come to visit and you're at those underwater windows and one of the otters is coming down to check out what you have uh, most likely that is rialto and then we had a little fun with him because who doesn't like baby otters? Uh, so this was Rialto's um, first Halloween, which is pretty relevant coming up on Halloween now. And because we had so many otters, we had to start uh, introducing them all together. So this was Rialto meeting Mac and Kunick for the first time in 2016 of November. Um, as you can see, he's the one who's in the little skimmer next to his trainer, who's a little, he's a little unsure of what's happening. Um, but they all became pretty fast friends very quickly. As you can see, they're basically um, play buddies right away. This was them in their first snow. Um, they hadn't really seen much of snow, so they didn't really know what to make of it. Um, but it was pretty adorable, and they learned pretty quickly that snow is just a uh, kind of ice, and they had a great time. And then just when we thought we had enough otters, we got another one about a year later. So this is Hardy, and he is probably one of the most photogenic little otter pups I have ever seen. Um, he is a little bit different from our other American otters. Um, he is a Canadian otter. Uh, so he was found off of Port Hardy. Um, he was found out in the ocean all by himself. Um, he was observed alone. He was vocalizing for his mom, but um, they waited and none of uh, no other sea otters were in the area. So they ended up bringing him to the Marine Mammal Rescue Center on June 26th. And he came to the aquarium shortly afterwards in July. Um, he was having that 24 hour care, just like all of our other pups. So the bottle feeds, um, being introduced to bigger swimming pools. And now he is three years old, so he is very big. He's also almost as big as the two older boys. Um, I find Hardy is usually quite easy to tell apart. He has the blondest cheeks and the longest whiskers. Um, he also um, is uh, very interactive with his toys. He loves his enrichment. Um, he's very wrestly. He's very active. He loves to play. Um, he also has quite a big following as well. So when he was very little, he um, had an otter camera in his nursery. So people really got to connect with him and um, watch as he grew up. And um, yeah, you can see him now. And he's a big, big, handsome otter. Um, and he is very interested and curious. He's a very curious little boy. And then we got another one. <laughs> so this is Taz Lena. Uh, so Taz is a female. Um, so she is um, about a, just over a year now. Um, so she was found up in Alaska as well. She was found by some fishermen all by herself. Um, she is named after a river in Alaska. And uh, we actually were sending, again, trainers up to Alaska to help with her rehabilitation. And um, I was one of the lucky ones who got to go up there and be part of that. Um, so I have Taz to thank for a little um, trip up to Alaska. 
And um, she was a very smart baby. She figured things out so quickly. We actually um, got to start training with her at two, three months old. So she she's a very, very smart little lady. And then um, she flew by a private plane um, to Vancouver in September. Um, she was actually really good on the plane. I was one of the lucky ones who got to be part of her transport back. Um, and she was um, very, very good on the plane. So that was that was much appreciated. And so in the last six months, um, she has been um, being introduced to all of our other other otters. So now she has uh, met every single one of them. So she is kind of fully into the otter family now. Um, she is still quite small though. She's only 20 kilograms. So she's about 10 kilograms smaller than the other otters. Um, she has very blonde cheeks. She has a very small little face, but she has a big personality. This otter has some confidence and sass to her. She is very interactive, very playful. Um, she has no fear. She will run up to an otter that is 10 kilograms heavier than her and jump on top of their head to play. So she is um, definitely very, very rambunctious. And then there is Joey. So Joey is our most recent addition. Um, so he is our seventh otter. And he only was admitted in July, so he's only about two and a bit months old now. Um, again, another Canadian otter, though, so he was found on Vancouver Island. Um, he was found all by himself. Unfortunately, his mother had passed away. Um, he was only just under two kilograms when he was admitted, um, but I think his most recent weight was almost eight kilograms, so he's definitely grown quite a bit. Um, and he was at, at the rescue center for the start of his rehabilitation, but he's come to the aquarium in the last couple of weeks. Um, he is still on that 24 hour human care. He's getting his bottle feeds every two hours, um, but we are actually starting to pull back on that now. He's uh, transitioning to um, big boy otter status where we're hopefully going to be sleeping through the night soon all by himself. Um, so, like I said, his next goals are sleeping throughout the night, um, transitioning from his bottles onto his solid foods. Um, he recently um, had his um, upgrade to the nursery, which is a much bigger room where he has more, more independence and more uh, space to be active. So he's been exploring that. He's also had a number of swims in the really big otter habitats now, which is um, really great. He can swim and dive and he's learning how to do all the all the otter stuff. So that was the intros to all of our otters. Um, so I'm just going to talk a little bit about what we do for their training and any research projects that we do. Um, the basis of the training that we do at the aquarium is all positive reinforcement. So basically that means that um, if we ask a behavior and if they do it correctly, we reinforce that with food or some sort of reward. And if they do anything that is incorrect, we just ignore that behavior and then move on. Um, so we reinforce with food and with toys. And it is really important to build up that relationship and building up um, that relationship with those food and toys is a great way to um, really um, work on that relationship with the otters. And we do lots of play sessions as well. And then we train um, lots of basics, things like husbandry, um, eye contact stationing, and then more advanced things like husbandry, target training, toy retrievals. Um, and we also use a lot of tools uh, for that, which is target pull, board training as well. And then, like I said, those advanced husbandry behaviors, so weights, kennel training, um, and then voluntary vaccines is an amazing thing as well. Um, doing lots of things in different ways, lots of variability is important for the training. And then we also do a lot of research projects as well. They were as part of a metabolic study, which is something that we basically did different diets with them. And um, hopefully we'll be able to learn some cool things about um, how much food and what kind of food otters need. Um, but I think uh, that's about all I had for the training session stuff. So I will, I think, send it over to you guys to do some questions. Amazing. Well, thank you so much, Rachel. I've personally learned so much more about each of the otters that we have at the Vancouver Aquarium. 
Yay. And we do have some wonderful questions. The first one from Maria is, what kind of education do you need to become a trainer? Um, so we usually have some sort of science uh, degree. So I actually have a marine biology degree. I was kind of um, very into marine biology from the start. Um, but animal biology, psychology, those are all um, really applicable things as well. But any sort of science degree. Amazing. And in the wild, do sea otters fight each other for territory and mates? And if so, do you see similar behavior with the otters at the Vancouver Aquarium? They definitely can. So um, around breeding season, that is something the males are generally quite competitive, um, trying to find some females. Um, and at the aquarium, um, we've actually been really lucky that our males have grown up together. So they all have really good relationships with each other. Um, but also because we're not a breeding facility, um, we are basically, we put them on um, birth control for otters, which reduces their testosterone level as well. So that kind of helps with that whole thing. Um, they're not actively trying to fight for mates because we're not a breeding facility. All right. And at the aquarium, what would a typical day look like for one of these otters? Uh, it seems like we see them swimming back and forth a lot, but what else are they doing? Yeah, so they have those five training sessions a day. So those are their basic um, every two hours. We um, do those feeding sessions, training sessions, and then we also love to give them enrichment sessions as well. So plays. Um, they're so playful that we love to give them toys. We love to give them ice um, and we also love to give them choices to interact with each other. So I think my favorite is basically we open up all of the doors and let them just kind of run crazy. I've definitely seen a lot of that action. <laughs> Um, and then this is more particular to uh, to Rialto, but why would a Washington otter be permanently placed up here? And then in respect to that, and does Alaska ha not have a facility for permanent care? So why are they coming to the Vancouver Aquarium? That is um, an excellent question. So Rialto, even though he was found in Washington, he is actually a northern sea otter. And that is why he was sent to Vancouver, because like I mentioned at the very start, um, a lot of the facilities in uh, the States only have southern sea otters. So because Rialto was a northern sea otter, they wanted to place him with other northern sea otters. And Alaska, um, they have a couple of otters there that have been there, I think, for a couple of years, but they generally have so many otter pups come through. Um, they don't have the space for as many as they have, which is when they find other homes for them. Yeah, I know that those animals that are being rehabilitated, but at least in Canada, the Department of Fisheries and Oceans deems if they would survive on their own being introduced back to the wild. So the government decides if they will stay in a facility for the rest of their life or if they get to go back for those exactly. babies. <laughs> Doesn't work out so well, usually. Yeah. Awesome. Well, it's so great that we get to uh, have those animals with us in our care at Vancouver Aquarium, which is part of OceanWise, one of the initiatives. Um, it looks like we are pretty much all out of questions, but thank you so much, Rachel, for an amazing talk and introducing us to those amazing sea otters. Thank you. And thanks for having me, you guys. And if you want to um, watch our sea otters, we have a lot of options for live cameras and live feeds right now. Um, so tune in at vanaqua.org and you can um, see some pretty cute otters in their natural habitats right now. Definitely. Now, there are some amazing new programs that are becoming soon. So next week, You'll want to tune in with us. Um, so let me just share my screen real quick here. So we got to talk to Rachel today, but next week and for the coming weeks, we're going to be doing some amazing talks with some of our winners of the Ocean Awards that we had. So the 25th year of this for OceanWise. And these awards are presented by OceanWise Research Institute to honor individuals and organizations for their highly significant contributions to ocean conservation through research, communication, and thoughtful leadership. So we're recognizing we recognize these winners in June, 
and we're going to be doing some amazing keynote presentations. Um, David Suzuki was the winner of the North Medal, and he was our keynote presentation for that program. And then we're going to continue after that with we're going to have our six winners throughout these next month or so. So, so next week, we are going to have the Coastal Guardian Watchmen, which I'm really excited to tune into. So they were one of the recipients uh, last year for the Conservation Leadership Award to support their social responsibility. So tune in for those programs. We also have uh, the book uh, program. So we have Kalan and the Stink Inc. And we're gonna have Lindsay Ackers from the Marine Mammal Rescue Center as well as the very special guest uh, who is going to ask Karen Otio, uh, as well as Emma Peterson. So we're going to get to learn about this wonderful, cute little book on September 22nd. So join us then, as well as we are, you know, please follow these Tales from the Deep programs. Uh, you can check them out on our OceanWise Facebook page and share them with friends, family, and others. Uh, and please tune in and let us know what you'd like to see more of. If there's anything in particular for you. But also a uh, special shout out this month is uh, Biodiversity Month and we are going to do biodiversity all week next week with uh, Backyard Bio. So follow hashtag Backyard Bio to get involved and explore the biodiversity in your backyard, as well as learn from others about their backyards. So amazing things to share coming up. As well, stay connected, just as Rachel said, there's lots of our live cams for different animals at the Vancouver Aquarium here in Vancouver, British Columbia, Canada as well as there are lots of resources on our education.ocean.org website with lots of activities, discussion boards, uh, online classes, and more. You can find out some of our education programs that are still going on despite the Vancouver Aquarium unfortunately closing for a temporary amount of time. And if you would like to help support us in this time of need, uh, please check out our van aqua.org page or oceanwise.org and uh, you can donate there. You can even donate to help specifically Joey in his care as well. So I'd like to say thank you all so much for joining us today and we hope to see you next week and the weeks following. Thanks everyone. Have a great day.